thank you everyone for coming. Um, this is the kickoff um, for Legacy Weekend, which is all about the 10th Mountain Division. First of all, my name is Jen Mason, um, and I'm the executive director of the Colorado Snow Sports Museum. And uh, so thank you very much for coming. Um, we do have a couple sponsors that I need to thank for our series. Uh, Town of Vale is very supportive of everything that we do here at the museum. And so um, just want to give a big shout out to the to the uh, Town of Vale and to Westvale Liquor Mart, who helps us with all the food and beverage um, that happens before. And um, so Legacy Weekend is this amazing weekend that goes on. It's the Town of Vale, the Ski Museum, and mainly Vale Resorts is kind of touting their history and kind of honoring the 10th Mountain Division for everything that they've done. So we thought it would be a great way to start the weekend by um, doing a deep dive into uh, Camp Hale and the 10th Mountain Division. So that's when we pulled in these two gentlemen, Flint Whitlock and Eric Miller. They wrote this amazing book called 10th Mountain Division at Camp Hale, and it's pretty incredible. And then Flint also previously had wrote This Soldiers on Skis, and I feel like I'm stealing Flint's thunder. But um, yeah, so super excited that these guys are here tonight, and um, I'm going to introduce both Eric Miller and uh, Flint. So Eric Miller, there, right there, a lieutenant, a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force Reserve. Thank you for your service. Uh, who lives in Pueblo? Who is stationed in Colorado Springs? Currently, he is he's living in Boston, attending a disaster medicine fellowship at Harvard. I had no idea. That's amazing. He's a former ski patrol and the co-author of the Arcadia book, of another book called Colorado Ski Patrol. And also he made this really great beer called um, Abby. What was it called, Abby? Abby Dog Ale. It was so good. Yeah. Aw. Yeah, so Eric is truly passionate, obviously, about the 10th Mountain Division and Colorado and Ski Patrol and everything. Um, that means, you know, this whole museum is pretty much Eric's passion. So it's pretty cool. And then, of course, we have Flint Whitlock here tonight. Um, so Flint's, uh, Flint is pretty incredible. He's been here a lot. So thank you very much. And he's always donating. These guys are we donating their we time We had to tonight. buy a condo in Vail because I was coming up here so often. Yeah. So Yes. So Flint is amazing, which is incredible. So he is here to present a lively and informative program about the 10th Mountain Division. His author, Flint, Flint Whitlock from Denver, the son, so he's a descendant, of the 10th Mountain Division veteran. Flint is the co-author of the highly acclaimed Soldiers on Skis, a pictorial history of the 10th Mountain Division and the most recent 10th Mountain Division at Camp Hale book. Flint is a 1964 graduate of the University of Illinois and is a U.S. Army officer, thank you for your service, who spent five years on active duty with the Army, including a year in Vietnam. He is an award-winning military historian and the author of scores of magazine articles and 17 books. I can't even write my own. Most of which deal with World War II. He has appeared on the History Channel. I saw that, which was incredible. On Fox News Channel, War Stories with Oliver North. And in two documentaries about the 10th, he regularly leads battlefield tours for the Smithsonian National Geographic and other groups and lectures on history topics for Viking cruise lines. So for 12 years, Flint was the editor of the national magazine World War II Quarterly. In his spare time, which I don't know if he has any, he is on the board of directors of the Broomfield Veterans Museum. And in 2001, he became the first military historian into the Colorado Authors Hall of Fame. Wow, that's quite the resume for both of these two. So thank you. So I'm going to pass it over to uh, Flint and Eric. And I know it seems ridiculous that we're using microphones. But just so you're all aware, we are, um, obviously, we're the Colorado Snow Sports Museum. And in order to preserve history, we are preserving all of these talks. We're recording them. And if they don't talk into the microphone, then the people, when they go to watch it, will not be able to hear what's going on. So at the end of it, we will do a QA and a and we'll do it with the microphone, and I'll run around so we can do that. But, um, yeah, so thank you to Flint and Eric for donating so much of your time to the museum and to the 10th Mountain Division and National Ski Patrol and all of keeping these stories alive. 
Thank you very much, Jen, and uh, welcome to all of you tonight. One thing that Jen didn't uh, say about Eric um, is that in in his spare time, he is a stand-up comedian. So in addition to his military duties, he also goes out and entertains the troops and whoever else might be out there. Yeah, that's very generous. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't. Is this, is this on? <laughs> um, I can also beatbox if you want me to. Um, listen, uh, tonight, I, I just want to tell you how the, the book came about. And um, what you're going to see tonight is not our normal presentation. And in fact, you're going to see me standing off to the side quite a bit. You're going to be in the gondola. Yeah, I, I will stay in the gondola because I'm a surprise. Um, he wasn't anticipating. Nobody was really anticipating me being here because I'm living in Boston. And so I literally flew in for this. And he turned around and, what are you doing here? And I'm like, surprise. So anyway, so this is not our normal presentation. You are going to find out who the brains of the outfit is. <laughs> Um, we, we pitched this book to Arcadia right about the time COVID hit. And so all the research that had to be done, and, and we owe a lot to um, the Ski Museum here um, who provided a lot of the pictures for the book um, and a lot of other different, uh, Leadville, God, I, all, all kinds of places. It took a lot of time to do the research, but even longer because we did it during COVID. Um, when I was... When I found out that Flint was willing to have me on the project, it was a real honor because he's, he's the brains behind the outfit. And it is just a, a real privilege for me to have had somebody of his caliber that would be willing to uh, put me on the tagline as a, as a co-author. So I am as excited to see the presentation that you're about to see as you are. Um, I'll help answer some questions afterwards, but usually it's, it's something like this. Well, um, what do you think, Flint? So um, I know you're going to enjoy it, and uh, thank you guys all for being here. Thank you, Eric. Um, one thing that uh, I want to also point out is that Eric usually wears pink flip-flops, which go very well with the Air Force uniform, uh, but because of the, all the snow and ice we have here, he's got uh, regular shoes on, so kind of miss, miss seeing your, your flip-flops. Okay, very good. <laughs> uh, title of the talk tonight is called Skiing Off to War with the 10th Mountain Division. And I want to give you a little uh, historical context because some people think, well, mountain warfare just began with the 10th Mountain Division, but actually it goes back way longer than that, back to the Stone Age. Here you see a, a, an illustration here of some cavemen uh, fighting off uh, some uh, invaders with, with stones. Uh, the Battle of Thermopylae between the Greeks and the Persians in 480 BC. Hannibal took his elephants from North Africa across the Pyrenees and the Alps. And you see one unlucky elephant right here in the middle. He's obviously did not get his winter uh, warfare training because uh, he's lost his footing and he's uh, falling to his doom. The Vikings in the 12th century put some of their soldiers on skis. And this uh, lithograph here, the Muscovites versus the Lithuanians in the 15th century. You can see they've got their men on skis as well. Um, nobody here was old enough to remember Valley Forge when Washington's army went into winter camp in 1777 and uh, suffered great hardship uh, in Pennsylvania during that period of time. Uh, in the early 1800s, the Norwegians put their soldiers on skis as well. Napoleon didn't know how to fight in the winter, and so his army was uh, turned back at the gates of Moscow in 1812. Sweden, again, put troops on uh, the skis. You can see a whole uh, group of guys coming down the hill. In World War I, there was a lot of fighting that went on in the uh, Italian Alps. So winter and mountain warfare has been going on for quite some time. Between World War I and World War II, a number of the European nations experimented with troops on skis, Finland, Italy, France, Norway. Uh, during the uh, Russian invasion of Finland in the winter of 1939, the Finnish troops, who were vastly outnumbered, uh, used their skills to really uh, stop the, the Russian invasion and, and 
inflict great casualties on the Soviet army. 168,000 Soviet troops were either killed or went missing during that particular battle. In September of 39, Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany decides it uh, be a good idea to invade Poland, part of his scheme to take over Europe. And uh, this caused France and Britain to declare war on Germany. There was a period of time called the Zitzkrieg, or the Phony War, from September of 39 to April of 1940, in which the two countries were technically at war, but they did not uh, actually have any fighting. The Maginot Line kept the Germans uh, at bay. But in April of 1940, Germany invaded Norway and Denmark. Norway, as you probably know, has a lot of mountains and a lot of cold weather. In May of 40, Germany then invaded France, Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg. The British Expeditionary Force arrived in France and Belgium to try and hold back the Germans, but the Germans pushed the British into the English Channel and they had to retreat from Dunkirk back to Britain. About this time, Italy decides uh, they want a piece of uh, their neighbor, Greece, and so they invaded Greece through the Balkan Mountains in October of 1940. Uh, they were not prepared for this type of terrain or this type of climate, and more than 10,000 Italian soldiers died of exposure, in addition to 25,000 uh, battle deaths. Well, the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini uh, called up his uh, good friend, maybe he sent him an email or text, uh, Adolf Hitler, and he said, I'm having a little problem in Greece, can you send me a couple of divisions, because uh, I'm kind of stuck here. And Hitler was, in, at that moment, preparing to invade the Soviet Union. And uh, Hitler said, well, if it won't take too long, I, ca I can do that. So he sent a couple of divisions in. We see here the German artillery shelling uh, the Greek positions in April of 41. And at the end of April, the uh, Germans had basically overrun all of Greece and uh, it was now occupied by Germany. At the start of the war, 1940, Germany had three mountain divisions, men who were specially trained for mountain and winter warfare. Uh, by the end of the war, they would have 14 such mountain divisions. Well, guess how many mountain divisions the US had? Who got the answer right? Yes, it's zero. Skiing at that time was a sport for the rich and famous, basically, because lift tickets could cost as much as $3 a day. I mean, not, not everybody could afford that. Uh, and a lot of uh, celebrities, movie stars, and people like Ernest Hemingway uh, took up the sport of skiing. Most of the time, they were at Sun Valley, Idaho. And uh, uh, you guys are too young to remember some of these names here, but uh, they, they were famous in their day, so I wanted to point that out. One man saw the deficiency that the U.S. Army had at that time in case the U.S. got involved in the war in Europe. And his name is Charles Minot Dole. He was the founder of the National Ski Patrol System. And he was writing letters, hundreds of letters, to President Roosevelt. And by the way, our dog is named Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and Army Chief of Staff George C. Marshall. And he kept harping on one theme, we've got to be ready to have soldiers prepared for fighting in cold and mountainous regions in Europe if we get involved in the war. Well, Roosevelt and Marshall were hoping that we wouldn't get involved in the war, and Marshall would write back to, to Minnie Dole and say, um, you know, if we do get involved in the war, we're going to need more regular type troops, infantry, armor, airborne, uh, I don't think we, we're going to have to spend time and money and effort on developing troops that can fight in mountainous areas. So they kept getting the cold shoulder from General Marshall. And finally, Minnie Dole and Roger Langley, who was head of the National Ski, uh, National Ski Association, formed a group called the Winter Warfare Committee, something of that sort. Uh, it's right here, National Volunteer Winter Defense Committee. And in October of 1941, Marshall, I think he was so sick and tired of getting these hundreds of letters from Minnie Dole that he said, all right, fine, 
you do it, I will authorize the National Ski Patrol System to be the official civilian recruiter for a mountain division. And that's all Minnie Dole needed. He sent out letters, uh, well, shortly after October of 41, we get involved in World War II with the attack on Pearl Harbor. So Minnie Dole sends out letters to all the ski patrol uh, chapters around the country, all the ski clubs, hi high school and college, all the ski areas. Everybody he, that he knew in, in skiing, he said, we're gonna have a mountain division and I want every young able-bodied man to volunteer for it, and they did. Uh, he also contacted the American Alpine Club and a similar letter went out to them uh, calling on mountain climbers to become part of this new uh, experimental unit. And it, uh, and it must have worked because lots of m young men signed up to join the mountain troops. In fact, this poster is right around the wall uh, in uh, the 10th Mountain exhibit there. There were uh, initially about 15,000 young men who uh, wanted to be a part of the ski troops. And the uh, people who were making the selection chose the best of uh, seven or 8,000 uh, of that group. Uh, you had to have three letters of recommendation to get in you know, to send in with your, your application. Uh, so it wasn't just anybody off the street that they were taking. Uh, so who served in the, in the tent? There are hundreds, maybe thousands, of American skiers and mountaineers who signed up for it. Uh, gentlemen like Dick Durrance, Pete Seibert, Steve Knowlton, John Litchfield, some of these people would go on to ski in the Winter Olympics of 1948. So these, and they were hotshot skiers from their college and high school teams. So they were, they were pretty, uh, pretty good skiers. There were also mountaineers such as Paul Petzold, who was a member of the first American climbing team that tried to climb uh, K2, the world's second highest mountain. And there were also hundreds of Europeans who signed up, men who had come over from Europe uh, as Hitler was gobbling up territory over there and they didn't wanna be a part of his army. So they uh, came to the US, they got jobs as ski instructors, um, and uh, they, were, they were quite well versed in the art of skiing. One of the men was Walter Prager, who was the Dartmouth College ski team coach. Uh, there were uh, several uh, Austrians, Tony Mott, Lugi Foger, Friedel Pfeiffer, who were all champion ski racers. Um, Peter Gabriel was a famous Swiss mountaineer, and he headed up the ski school in New Hampshire at Franconia. Uh, I'm sure all of you have watch the movie The Sound of Music. Well, the two Von Trapp brothers, sons, uh, were part of the 10th Mountain Division. One was a medic, one was a machine gunner. Uh, they had a, a, a guy who was a, a falconer, a uh, couple of people who were experts with the bow and arrow, maybe a bear tamer or two. Uh, they also had my dad, Jim Whitlock, who was one of the uh, soldiers who went into the 605th Field Artillery Battalion. There was a, probably the most uh, famous skier in the unit was a man named Torger Tokla. He was a Norwegian and he was the holder of the world's record in the ski jump. And everybody who knew anything about skiing knew T Torger Tokla. Torger, it was told to me, by one of the people I interviewed for Soldiers on Skis. To demonstrate how strong his legs were, he went into the supply room one day, and without taking a step, he jumped up and over the counter. There were also other specialties that were required. Lumberjacks, blacksmiths, forest rangers, cowboys and rodeo riders. That seems kind of odd. But one of the men who, who joined up was a rodeo champion from Southern Colorado, Jim Like. Uh, the reason was because they were going to have 4,000 pack mules and horses in the division. Because in a mountainous uh, terrain, you can't get trucks or vehicles uh, of any kind up through uh, areas where there are no roads. And uh, they, could, they could pack the mules with uh, quite a lot of uh, equipment, uh, weighing a lot of, of uh, many pounds. So here's a recoilless rifle on the back of a mule. I don't think they actually fired the recoilless rifle from the mule. That would have singed his ears probably. Um, 
So while the unit was recruiting soldiers, the first unit was the 87th Mountain Infantry Regiment. And they began training at Paradise Lodge on Mount Rainier. Here we see some of the troops out on a exercise across the snow. And while that was going on, the Army was looking for a permanent home for a mountain division. They looked at Camp Lewis, Washington, where uh, Mount Rainier is. They looked at Camp Snelling, Minnesota, lots of snow up there. Great Sand Dunes National Monument, you know, big ski area that we all know and love here. Uh, Camp Ord in California, Camp Ethan Allen in Vermont, and West Yellowstone, Montana. So out of all of these places, the one place they decided on was Pando, Colorado. How many people have ever heard of Pando, Colorado? Yeah, about half a dozen. Um, this is what it looked like. It was an area called Eagle Park, about 9,200 feet above sea level. There was a swampy area, and the Eagle River kind of meandered through, and there was lots of trees and underbrush. And located, you can see Denver, Camp Hale, Vail is right above it, Leadville is right below it. A little closer view between Minturn and Leadville. How many have ever been to the Camp Hale site? Just about everybody. Okay, well, we're done with this. So we can go back to that. Um, it was named after Brigadier General Irving Hale. Hale was quite the interesting person. This is a plaque. I just I took this photo yesterday at on the south side of the state capitol. I never knew it was there. It says Irving Hale, scholar, soldier, citizen. He was the valedictorian of East High School in Denver in 1877. He got a commit or got a an appointment to West Point, and he compiled the highest grade point average ever recorded at West Point. And at least at the time that they put up this plaque, nobody had ever exceeded that. And I think to this day, nobody has ever exceeded that. He led the Colorado Regiment in the Spanish-American War that captured Manila in the Philippines. In the Philippines, and as an engineer, he installed Denver's first successful electric street railway system in the late 1880s. And he also was one of the founders of VFW. So if you're going to name an army camp after an individual, you know, it'd be hard to get somebody uh, better than Irving Hale. This is a, a view of downtown Pando, Colorado, which consisted of a railroad uh, depot and a couple of ice houses. Uh, the men who went to Camp Hale called themselves the Pando Commandos. And uh, the Army said, well, now that we've uh, acquired this property, we've we got to do something with it. So they hired uh, Black and Veatch engineers out of Kansas City and Platt Rogers out of Pueblo. And they formed an entity called Pando Constructors, and they began clearing out all of the vegetation from the valley. Uh, they straightened out the Eagle River. Uh, and then they began building the uh, camp itself. Now, they hired 10,000 men to do this. And think about it. Wartime, everybody was going in the military. So, you know, unless you had a deferment or you were over age, uh, you were probably going into the military. But they found 10,000 men. They brought them up here to the high country. They had to build their own living quarters, their own camp, before they could start building uh, the military camp. And they did that. Uh, it was pretty amazing. Here's a shot of uh, some of the buildings that uh, are almost completed. This is the field house where they had athletic events and ceremonies and concerts and dances and things. 18,000 square feet for that building. Uh, this is an aerial view looking down on the camp. You can, the building here in the front is a 650-bed hospital. Um, and then you can see the rest of the the camp spread out behind it. You can also see this pall of smoke because all of the buildings had coal stoves. And so in the wintertime especially, the smoke would, would uh, uh, kind of linger in the valley and a lot of the soldiers came down with a respiratory condition called the Pando Hack. Um, there's an, a view from the other end of the, of the camp uh, and you can see the, this is 1943. Okay. So a little bit of, of uh, 
statistics here, Camp Hale. Construction begins in April of 1942, but the other photo was from 43. But you anticipated well, thank you. And they were completed in November of 42, seven months. My next door neighbor has been remodeling his kitchen for seven months. These people built an entire city in seven months. There were, like I said, there were 10,000 construction workers. Uh, somewhere between 800 and 1,000 buildings were up. There was, they had to put in roads, they had to put in sewers, water lines, power plants. Uh, it was just, you know, basically building a city from scratch. And what do you think it cost? Anybody throw out a number? You cheated. You looked in the back of the book. Well, it was originally estimated at $5 million. And it went to 31, and I left the five off, I guess. $31 million, which in today's dollars would be the equivalent of about $400 million. So what did the Army get for their money? You can see here, this is the north end of the camp. Uh, we've got the hospital at the north end. We've got barracks down here in front. We've got the mule barns and, and horse barns, the stables. Uh, there's the field house down the left-hand side there, more of the barracks. There's a combat village up the, uh, the valley that way, rifle range, B slope, which is where uh, people who didn't know how to ski, like my dad, uh, first uh, learned how to ski. This is Highway 24 that connects Minturn with Leadville. This is the main entrance of the camp. There's the headquarters of the division. They also had uh, something like 240 members of the Women's Army Corps. They weren't members of the 10th Mountain Division per se. They were assigned to the camp. Uh, most of them you know, were involved in secretarial duties or running the switchboard or driving officers around the camp. Um, but, but they pay, played an important part in the life of the camp. Uh, sometimes the 10th has been called the guinea pig division. Uh, that's because the Army was always sending uh, equipment and, and uh, other items for them to test to see if, if they you know, were worthwhile. And so they would get vehicles all the time. What, what's going to operate best in this uh, terrain on snow, et cetera? So here's kind of a miniature Jeep. Uh, here's kind of an early forerunner of a snowmobile. Uh, that looks kind of like a snowcat. Uh, but the vehicle that they decided would best suit their purposes was called an M29 Weasel. It was made by Studebaker. And you, it could carry three men, a lot of uh, supplies and equipment in there. It could tow uh, a, a number of men behind it. Uh, so that, that became the vehicle that they adopted. Uh, here you see some of the troops jumping off of one of the uh, weasels. Uh, they also had uh, sled dogs. And um, when the machines and the animals couldn't get the job done, then the men became the pack animals. Uh, there's a song that the 10th Mountain adopted as, as theirs called 90 Pounds of Rucksack. And I would sing it for you, but I don't want to scatter the crowd too early here. Uh, so while this is going on at Camp Hale, the war is, is heating up. In November of 1942, about the time Camp Hale is finished, Operation Torch, the invasion of North Afri Africa, begins. This is the first time that American troops have gone into battle on the ground against uh, the enemy, Germans and Italians. Uh, some scenes from the North African campaign. Camp Hale, they're still uh, training. In the 85th and 86th Mountain Infantry Regiments have been formed. And so now we've got a, a full division of three regiments. Uh, Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily. I'm writing a, a book on Operation Husky right now, as a matter of fact. Uh, takes place in July of 43. Uh, this results in Mussolini getting canned. Uh, he is thrown out of office because Sicily falls to the Allies. Hitler decides he's going to garrison the entire peninsula of Italy, uh, even if the Italians weren't fighting alongside with him. Meanwhile, back at Camp Hale in the summertime, the, the boys were getting in their practice climbing rocks and, and cliffs. Uh, and in August of 43, something interesting happens. The island of Attu in the Aleutian chain 
off of Alaska uh, was captured by the Japanese. So they're on American soil now. And a very uh, difficult campaign took place to evict the Japanese from Attu. And the, finally, the Americans did. Kiska becomes the next target because the Japanese had also uh, captured that island. And so in August of 43, Operation Cottage was organized, 34,000 Allied troops, Canadians, uh, Americans, and the 87th Mountain Infantry Regiment was uh, a part of that as well. This is uh, Kiska Harbor. You can see the number of warships that are uh, going into the harbor to support the effort. Uh, there were some casualties. What was interesting was that the, there were no Japanese there. They had all evacuated about a week before Operation Cottage took place. But you can see uh, up here in this picture, the, the mountains are all shrouded with clouds. And so when the troops got off of their landing craft and they went up into the mountains, they heard noises in the fog and they started firing back and forth at each other. Well, it turns out they're, they're shooting their own men. And as a result, 17 of the 87th Regiment were killed and 50 were wounded. There were also a number of booby traps that the Japanese left behind. And a total of 313 Allied troops were either killed or wounded during an operation that really didn't need to happen. Meanwhile, back at Camp Hale, guys are earning their $21 a month, having fun. Uh, in September of 43, the invasion of southern Italy takes place called Operation Avalanche at uh, Salerno. Camp Hale, they're still, uh, still training. Combat in Italy in the fall and winter of 43-44 goes on. The battle for the Gustav Line at Monte Cassino takes place at that time. Operation Shingle, which is the Anzio invasion, takes place in January of 44. And at Camp Hale, they're working on their snowplow turns. In January of 44, the 87th returns from Kiska. They come back to Camp Hale in their nice shiny white uniforms. And they join up. And now we have the full division, which at that time was called the 10th Light Division Alpine Pack, about 14,000 men. And uh, here men like my father learned how to ski the army way by the numbers. This is probably my dad up here waiting to come down the bunny hill. And they were also going up the hill. I don't think there was a, a unit in the U.S. Army that was any better conditioned than the men who were at Camp Hale with the 10th. There was a lure and mystique about the mountain troops. Um, here's... Uh, Walter Prager on the cover of Life magazine. Here's a uh, Saturday Evening Post with an illustration of a 10th Mountain Man uh, in his white camouflage. Warner Brothers came to Camp Hale in 1943 and filmed a, uh, basically it was a recruiting film. It was about 21 minutes long. If you go on YouTube, you can see this film. And it's, it's quite interesting. It's in Technicolor and uh, the acting isn't half bad. Uh, it's a little hokey, but uh, the fact that it was shot at Camp Hale is, is very important, I think. Uh, Paramount did a picture called I Love a Soldier, which takes place, they don't really name it, but I think uh, it takes place in Leadville and at Camp Hale. Uh, the 10th was also called the Jackass Division. Well, obviously, because of all of the mules there. Uh, the mules, as I said, were hardy animals. They were capable of carrying hundreds of pounds on their back and going through terrain where there were no roads. Um, and, uh, but, but somebody said, you know, the, they're, they're having problems getting through the deep snow. And so they decided, well, let's see if we can develop some, some shoes, some snowshoes to put on the mules. And you see up here a, a horse wearing snowshoes, but the mules didn't like it for some unknown reason. If you've ever tried to put socks on a cat, you get an idea of, of how the mules reacted. Uh, so Camp Hale was, was becoming a very boring place. Uh, the men, all they did was train or peel potatoes. And uh, they were wondering if, if they were ever going to get in the war. You know, they've done all this training, over a year of training, and uh, the Army has no job for them. 
And so uh, things start to go south a little bit. What do young, healthy men have on their minds when they're far from home? And of course, Betty Grable is the correct answer. Uh, Leadville being the largest city that's close to the camp, about 20 miles away, uh, the soldiers would, would go into Leadville on their weekend passes, but unfortunately, Leadville had a very thriving red light district, and uh, an army report said the morals of Leadville are said to be on a rather low plane, and that's putting it mildly. Uh, Leadville was often off limits to any of the soldiers from Camp Hale. And then came along the infamous D-Series, uh, about three weeks of hell from March 26th to April 15th of 1944. This was kind of like the final exam that the Army would give to a division to see if they were ready, willing, and able to go into combat. And so the troops marched off into the uh, surrounding mountains of Camp Hale, took their mules with them, and for these three weeks lived in the wild, in snow caves, uh, did uh, military uh, uh, drills and tests to see if they were capable of uh, uh, fighting in this kind of environment. And uh, then in, in April, the troops came marching down. They were pretty happy. They thought that they had done a very good job uh, and felt that they were ready for war. But was the war ready for them? Uh, in June of 1944, on the 4th of June, R Rome was liberated by American troops. Two days later, Operation Overlord, the D-Day invasion of Normandy. At that point, basically, the war in Italy, you know, relegated to the back pages. And at Camp Hale, the troops are wondering, you know, what's, what's going to happen to us? Are we ever going to get into the, this combat? The Army really didn't know what to do with the 10th. Uh, there were some proposals that let's let's break them up and send the the, the individual men out to various units uh, as replacements for their battle casualties. Uh, there was another proposal that said let's just you know forget the mountain part and ju just turn them into a regular flatland type of in infantry division. Uh, nobody really knew, but there were, there were problems with the division as it was constituted. They had these small 75 millimeter pack howitzers, great for mountain fighting, but not so great uh, if you're in a, in a larger uh, battlefield area. Uh, and they had all those uh, mules and horses. So the Army said, eh, I think we're just going to close the book on, on the 10th. But some new things were happening. In the summer of 44, the troops went down to the Pando Depot, got on a troop train, and headed out going east to Camp Swift, Texas, hot, humid, dusty, and without a mountain in sight. Well, he thought the morale was low at, at Camp Hale in April. Uh, it really dropped when they got to uh, Camp Swift. They were run through the uh, drills of, of regular Army units. Uh, the men got a little uh, deep into their cups. Uh, some of the men uh, went AWOL or otherwise got in trouble and uh, were court-martialed, and it looked pretty bleak for the 10th. But the division got a new commanding general, George Hayes, uh, who, had been, uh, who had received the Medal of Honor in World War I. Now, Hayes didn't know anything about mountains or mountain troops or anything like that, but he knew how to lead men. And he was kind of the, the shot in the arm that the men needed, and just in time, because they had just gotten orders to go overseas. And they had also been upgraded in their unit designation from the 10th uh, Light Alpine Division to the what we know them today as the Mountain Division. Went uh, by train to Hampton Roads, Virginia in December of 44. Uh, Mark Clark, the uh, commander of 15th Army Group in Italy, said, you know, I'm stuck in the Northern Apennines. I need some, some more troops. Uh, the 10th Mountain becomes the last American Army Division to go overseas. As soon as they left Camp Hale, Camp Hale gets torn down. $31 million investment, gone. Here are the troops arriving in Naples Harbor that you can see is a little bit of a mess. And they go from Naples, they're transported northwards past Rome, up north of Pisa and Florence into the northern Apennines where the Germans have established a defensive line 
just south of the Po River Valley. You see Lake Garda up there, which is uh, Italy's largest lake that will come into play in a little bit here. And they're put into the line. Uh, they're put in this uh, area of uh, very steep mountains. Uh, this is a picture I took in 1995 when I went over with some 10th Mountain veterans on the 50th anniversary of the reclimb of Riva Ridge, and I got to climb with them, and it's one of the high points of my life, I'll tell you. Um, this is a shot that was taken in 1945. Uh, this is what the mountains looked like at that time. The Germans were up on top. They had their artillery and their artillery observers up there. They didn't think there were any uh, units that were capable of of climbing Riva Ridge. This is a schematic showing how the mountains are laid out. There's Riva Ridge on the left. We have here Mount Belvedere, Mount Gorgolesco, and a string of mountains that lead up here. And so a anytime the Germans saw any buildup of troops in the lower area, they could call artillery fire down on it and, and break it up. So all the uh, previous attempts to break through that area were unsuccessful. So the Army said, well, you know, 10th Mountain Division, they've never been in combat before. They're just, uh, you know, we call them Eisenhower's playboys. Uh, let's see what they can do. They can't do any worse than anybody else has done up to this point. And so the men uh, got ready for their introduction into combat. Here's General Hayes. I guess this is General Hayes' dog uh, taking a look at Riva Ridge and trying to figure out the best way to get up there. And you can see these dotted lines. They figured out five routes to the top. And so on the night of February 18th, 19th, uh, a 1,000 men from the 10th Mountain Division began climbing Riva Ridge. Uh, there was no preliminary artillery bombardment to alert the enemy that an attack was coming. And uh, they get to the top of the hill about dawn. And they overrun the German positions on the top. There's a dead German soldier in the foreground. And uh, within the span of a few hours, they're in control of Riva Ridge. Now, this leaves the uh, Mount Belvedere area open for attack. You can see Riva Ridge in the background. This is a picture taken from Mount Belvedere looking back at Riva Ridge. Uh, it was a bloody affair on Mount Belvedere. There were heavy casualties there. Uh, and so the next month, March of 45, uh, the Army said, well, you know, the 10th Mountain, you guys did pretty well. And so to reward you, we're going to let you spearhead the next offensive. It's one of the uh, rewards you get when you're successful in battle. And so they, they move into further up north through the mountains. Again, the casualties are heavy. It's a very uh, serious uh, fight that went on. And the world... Ski jump champion Torger Tokla is killed during this March offensive. I think everybody was very shaken by what had happened to their hero, and they vowed that they were going to avenge his death. In April of 45, Operation Craftsman, which is going to be the largest uh, combined American and British offensive through the northern Apennines into the Po River Valley, was launched. And the 10th was, again, the spearhead of that. Here we see some of the troops marching up one of the mountain roads. Uh, the Army at this point staged the last horse-mounted cavalry charge in battle. These were troops from the 10th Recon uh, platoon. And uh, it did not go well for the men and the horses. But they did break through. Uh, during this battle, John McGrath became the sole Medal of Honor recipient of the 10th. Uh, some of you may know the name Bob Dole. Um, he was a new lieutenant. He had been assigned to the 10th as a replacement officer. He had never been at Camp Hale before. He, he was not a skier or anything like that. But he was a platoon leader, and he was attacking a machine gun nest with his men. And many of them were killed, and he was seriously wounded. Spent many months in Army hospitals trying to recuperate. Almost lost the use of his uh, right arm. You may recall when he was running for president in 96 that he would carry a pen in his right hand. He never shook hands with his right hand because it was basically useless. But that's how he got his wound. They get to the Po River. The Germans have blown all the bridges. 
There's no way to get across except by boat, and so the 10th becomes the first American unit to cross the Po River. They get to the other side, they begin chasing the Germans towards the Southern Alps. Uh, Robinson Duff, the assistant division commander, is seriously wounded when his Jeep hits a mine, and they bring in Colonel William Darby as the assistant division commander. Some of you may know the name Darby's Rangers. It was a commando type unit that was formed in uh, the early 40s, and Darby was the commander of that. Unfortunately, his uh, rangers were almost totally wiped out during the fighting at Anzio, so he was a, a man without a command, and so he, he was made uh, the assistant division commander of the 10th Mountain Division. Here are the troops at Lake Garda, Italy's largest lake. Across on the other side of the lake was Villa Feltrinelli, which was Mussolini's summer uh, resort, I guess you could call it. The troops decided they want to go across, see what was there, maybe pick up a few sou souvenirs along the way, and you'll find some of Mussolini's uh, souvenirs that they got in the museum here. Uh, they went across the lake in what were called ducks. These were amphibious trucks. Unfortunately, one of them was very overloaded, and it sank, and 24 men drowned in Lake Garda. A few years ago, they found the, uh, the sunken duck uh, they did not find any human remains, but the vehicle is still there at the about 800 feet of water. Darby himself was killed by what some say was the last German artillery round fired in World War II in Italy at the town of Torboli at the northern end of Lake Garda. On May 2nd, the Germans in Italy surrender, and in the rubble-strewn streets of their villages, the Italian civilians laugh, dance, kiss their liberators, and it's a joyous time. The 10th happened to find a German warehouse full of alcoholic beverages, uh, schnapps, beer, wine, champagne. Here's my dad right here enjoying some champagne, the fermented fruits of victory, I guess you could call it. And the, deci the, the division decided to celebrate the end of the war, and the one way that seemed most appropriate for them. They organized a ski race on the slopes of Mount Mangart, where the mountains of Yugoslavia, Italy, and Austria come together. Um, Chris Anthony has put together a documentary called Mission Mount a Mangart. How, how many of you have seen that movie? Okay, about half of you, great. It's a, it's a wonderful tribute to what the men did. Uh, the winner of the uh, event was Walter Prager, the Dartmouth College ski team coach. And so the men thought, well, maybe the war's over for us, but they were on orders to invade Japan. Uh, but fortunately for them, the two atomic bombs were dropped on Japan and they surrendered. The 10th returned home in August of 45. Uh, but they left behind 1,000 men killed and 4,000 wounded. This was the uh, U.S. Military Cemetery in Florence, Italy, where several hundred of the 10th men are buried. But the can-do mountain spirit that uh, propelled them to victory in every battle where they never gave up a foot of ground also propelled them into great things in civilian life. Some went up into politics, like Bob Dole, who ran for president in 96. Uh, others went into business. David Brower was president of the Sierra Club. Ben Duke was president of the Gates Rubber Company in Denver. Merrill Hastings became the publisher of Skiing Magazine in New York. Bill Bowerman became the University of Oregon track coach and the U.S. Olympic track coach in 72 and was the founder of the Nike Corporation. Not a bad career path. Paul Petzold was the founder of the National Outdoor Leadership School. He just died a, a couple of years ago. Uh, vail, you all know the story of Vail, and many of the 10th Mountain men behind it, Paul Siebert, Bob Harker, and Sarge Brown. Aspen had several 10th Mountain veterans involved in creating that resort. Friedel Pfeiffer, John Litchfield, Percy Rideout, Fritz Benedict. A Basin was founded by 10th Mountain veteran Larry Jump. Steamboat, which had been around before World War II, also had 10th Mountain veterans uh, involved, Gordon Wren, Rudy and Carl Schnackenberg, 
and over 50 areas around the country had at least one Tenth Mountain veteran involved in some aspect of its operation. And the sport of skiing after the war took off on an upward trek that shows no sign of slowing down. So what happens to the Tenth after the war? Well, they're disbanded, deactivated in 1945, but reactivated in 1985. Do we have some of the modern Tenth gentlemen here? Okay, we've got two of the guys. Yep, yep, give it up. They were uh, established at Fort Drum in upstate New York and are still there today. And uh, are known as the Army's most deployed division, having fought in Haiti, Bosnia, Somalia, Iraq, Afghanistan, and maybe a few places we don't know about yet. Uh, and believe it or not, they still use mules. So what's happened to Camp Hale? Where, where is that today? Um, today it's, it's mostly just a, a flat open valley, traces of some roads and a bridge and uh, foundations of some of the buildings. This is the uh, remains of the field house, looking kind of like an ancient Roman ruin. And last October, President Biden was at Camp Hale to uh, officially name it uh, a national monument. So hopefully some good things will be happening with Camp Hale and some preservation efforts and, and some uh, things that will, will uh, help it regain a, a position in the public consciousness. Up at the top of Tennessee Pass, about 10 miles north of Leadville, is the turnoff for Ski Cooper. During World War II, it was called Cooper Hill, and it was the site of the longest T-bar in the world, over a mile long. Uh, and that's where the 10th Mountain soldiers got their advanced ski training. Uh, after the war, it was turned into a civilian uh, ski area, which it is today. And at the turnoff is the 10th Mountain Division War Memorial. And here on this 15-foot uh, tall slab of red granite, are the names of all 1,000 men of the 10th who died in World War II. Uh, I point out up here Torger Tokla's name as one of the 1,000 who are inscribed on the monument. Every year on Memorial Day, for the past 50 some years, I'm not sure how long it's been going on since 1959, I believe was the first one, uh, there's been a Memorial Day ceremony held at Tennessee Pass, at the monument. You can see here some of the ceremony taking place. And those 10th Mountain veterans who are still able to, they and their families make the long trek to the monument to pay homage to their fallen comrades. I took this photo in 2014. These were the 10th Mountain veterans who were there for that ceremony and it's my understanding that all of them are now gone. I like to think of the 10th as they were 80 years ago, young, vibrant, uh, incapable of defeat, willing to take on any challenge, knowing that they could accomplish whatever they set out to do. And I wanna close just by saying most of the 10th Mountain men lived their lives after the war by their motto, Sempre Avante, always forward. And I also want to mention that my co-author here, Eric, and I have copies of the books for sale, if you would care to find out more, because I've really just touched the surface in this presentation. But I thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, we'll be more than happy to try and answer them. Have you ever heard the uh, saying, uh, sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart or something like that? I mean, you have no idea how lucky you are. I, this was amazing. What a privilege, really. And this, most of these pictures I've never seen. I haven't heard all of this um, from Flint. You can see why it was a privilege for me to be as the co-author on, on the book with him. Um, that was really amazing. <laughs> I, I learned, um, I was already in awe of the 10th. 
um, being in the military, knowing the history and all that, but holy smokes, that was really, um, that was something. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. He, he talked about the T-bar. I'm going to, and so I know you may have some questions. I want to prompt a few questions specifically about Camp Hale because there was some, there was some shenanigans that went on that I know he's going to know more about, and it's kind of fun to know the history. One, the T-bar. It was the longest T-bar um, ski lift in the world. I just found out from Ron that there's a T-bar back there that was actually from it, so make sure you go and see that. That's really cool. A couple of things that were, um, how, how long did it take them to take it down? It only took, what, six months to build it, but it only took them a few months to tear it down. Well, it's always easier to tear things down than to build them, so it was two or three months. Uh, they had, it was interesting, too, because part of Camp Hale was used as a prisoner of war camp for the German Africa Corps soldiers that had been captured in North Africa. And so they were housed at Camp Hale in their own separate compound. And when it came time to tear down the camp, these POWs were enlisted in the uh, job of tearing down the now camp. Now, you're going to think that I prompted him to do this. But as a follow-up, some of the nurses were really fond of some of these prisoners of war, weren't they? Yeah. And yeah. there was a real controversy um, with uh, some of that and a spy scandal and everything that a lot of people, in fact, until we started doing this book, I had never heard this. Can you give a real brief rundown on what happened? Yeah, there, there was a, one of the uh, American soldiers, he was not a part of the 10th Mountain. He was in a different unit uh, made up of, I guess you could call malcontent soldiers. And why they put them in charge of guarding the POW compound at Camp Hale, I have no idea. But there was a young man named Dale Maple. And he got, because he spoke like seven or so languages, went to Harvard. He was, he was a brain. And yeah, no, n no association with my deal with Harvard. That's right. You're not allowed to be in that wing of the college. <laughs> uh, and so uh, Dale got kind of friendly with the German soldiers. And as it turned out, he was also kind of a pro-Nazi kind of guy. And uh, he'd been kicked out of some clubs at Harvard for showing up in a Hitler costume or something. And um, so he, uh, he gets chummy with some of the prisoners. And, and he says, you know, I think I can work it out where I can spring a couple of you guys. And we can go down to Mexico, get passage across the Atlantic, get back to Germany or wherever the German army is fighting. And uh, I'll, I'll join the German army with you, and uh, everything will be cool. And so he says, uh, he goes out and he buys a, a used car. And I don't know how he did it, but he got two of the Germans out of the camp. They got in the car, got into civilian clothes, headed down through southern Colorado and New Mexico, and they get to the border with Mexico, and the car breaks down, and they kind of walk across the border, and they're stopped by Mexican police. And uh, the FBI is called. Um, they're brought back to the States. Dale Maple is tried for treason, sentenced to death, uh, but his sentence is commuted to life in prison. And I think he served like five or six years of his sentence. And he ended up being an insurance salesman in California. So. And all right here in Colorado. But now the nurses, there was like four nurses yeah. that had some amorous for these yeah. Germans that were writing letters. Is that correct? Well, there was there was some uh, hanky-panky going on between the nurses. they drop out, drop around to the uh, wire enclosure where the Germans were. They weren't supposed to have any contact with them, but apparently they were slipping notes back and forth. And when the uh, Army found out about this, uh, I don't know if they were nurses or wax, one, one of the two. Um, they were, they received a dishonorable discharge from the service for uh, consorting with the enemy. And, and for the younger people, hanky-panky is like kissing. Um, that wasn't right over. Over. Right, J Jen didn't get that. Um, so when they did tear down um, uh, Camp Hale, a lot of the wood floors and stuff were reused. And I was uh, told when we were doing the research of the book, a lot of the older houses in Minern 
um, or <laughs> and uh, Redcliffe are actually the wood floors from Camp Hale. So I thought that was interesting. Also, when I was researching the book, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my girlfriend. Um, I saw a picture up at um, Nova Guides, and there was this uh, beautiful young lady who was dancing in 1942 at Camp Hale. Um, she was very pretty, and I was, and they had her name on there, Ella Warren Burnett. And so I was talking to, at that time, the owner of Nova Guides. He's like, oh, yeah, Ella's alive down in Mentor. Like, well, God, she's got to be ancient. And so I called, and um, no kidding, Ella was still alive. And so I went up there, and I actually took my military uniform, and I danced with Ella at her house. And so in the last four years, she was 90, let's see, four years, nine, nine, seven, she was 93 at the time. Um, I have, we've maintained our friendship. And so tonight, we just had dinner uh, with Ella. Um, up in Menern with her niece, Phyllis. She was going to try to come today, but she was at the senior center, and she was kind of tired. So anyway, so Ella is still there. There are still roots still um, into Camp Hale. And there's a, a photo in the uh, 10th Mountain Division Camp Hale book of 1,000 people dancing at the uh, field house, and we think maybe Ella's in there someplace. Yeah, we're wondering. I, I asked her tonight. I said, I'm going to see Flint. I said, I, I wonder if you actually danced with her, his dad. And <laughs> so what? She, she was from Redcliffe. She was 17 years old at the time. And so they would go out to the communities and get young ladies to come and dance uh, with them. Now, in the actual picture of Ella dancing, there is a woman way in the background you see um, with just her hand up. You can't see her clearly, you can just see her hand up. And she goes, that was my mother. She would le never let me go by myself. <laughs> and so they, what they would do is they'd take ambulances and buses to the smaller communities, Leadville, Redcliffe, Minturn, and um, some of the young ladies, they would come on. They were, it was very strict. I mean, they had their names and they got off the bus and when they got back on the bus, nobody, there was no hanky-panky is what I'm getting at. So... Um, but Not anyway, neither hanky nor panky. No hanky or panky. And then the tenth guys. Are you guys from Fort Drum, or are you? Okay, were you up at the event today? Yeah. When we came over the pass today, we stopped there. Um, saw Chris Anthony, who uh, we talked about. Um, we didn't get to stay for the ceremony, but that was uh, pretty exciting to to see everybody up there. So. Oh, is it, or is that the 140th? I was in the Colorado Guard as well. Okay, perfect. All right, I will uh, shut up. I think that's all <laughs> of the the prompts that I had for you, okay. and we will answer any questions. The book, by the way, I don't think there's any crossover on the pictures. Um, Arcadia has very strict standards on on the quality of the pictures and things like that. It couldn't. Um, so some of these were, I thought maybe even cooler than some of the pictures that we have. Um, also, I wanted to say something on one more thing. The weasel, that Studebaker, you saw the guys standing behind their skin. Do you remember that one? That went up to 36 miles an hour. Now, working on ski patrol, I would, I would jump behind a snowmobile and do the same thing they were doing. So I've gone pretty fast, but I don't know if it was 36 miles an hour. <laughs> and you know, Army, um, Army Smart, they were probably going at least 36. <laughs> so. I'm Air Force. You own, you own a weasel? Should be right here, right here. It's located in the museum. There is a really cool museum in Idaho Springs at the old firehouse in Idaho Springs, right outside of I-70. And the weasel that's in there belongs to the museum. Does it And run? there's a photo of it right there. Does it run? And can we go play with it? It does run. I wanted to go in the Vail Parade. Well, Fort Drum's close to Boston. I'll come on up. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, the question was, why did they take down Camp Hale so quickly after the 10th left? And it was because the Army felt that creating this mountain division was a failed experiment, that uh, it required so much time, energy, and money to maintain it, and 
once the division had left, the Army said, well, we're not going to have any more mountain divisions that are going to be training here at Camp Hale. We would have to keep all of the buildings heated nine months out of the year so the pipes don't freeze. It would be a tremendous economic burden to maintain a camp that nobody is using, so let's just tear it down. And some of the buildings went to Camp Carson, which is now Fort Carson. Uh, some of them were purchased by ranchers and other homeowners in the area. Um, but, you know, it was, a, it was a major financial hit that the government took on that. Now, was it, wasn't there some buildings left, and there was one of the federal agencies still did some remote training here for a couple of years, but not long? Well, in the... That's true. There, there were a couple of buildings that were left. Uh, in the 50s, there were Quonset huts. I don't know if you know what a Quonset hut is. It's a, it's a building that has a curved roof. It looks like a really big corrugated pipe, only just half of it. Yeah. And, and those were installed at Camp Hale, a couple hundred of them, I think, because the CIA was training Tibetan guerrillas to be uh, secretly flown into Tibet to fight against the Chinese army that had taken over their home country. And that went on for a couple of years. But it was a big secret. I think they probably had a wall around the camp so you couldn't, if you were driving on Highway 24, you wouldn't even know that there was anything going on there. Didn't for years they have some munitions that they, they kept a lot of the camp on the one side shut down because... Yeah, um, from time to time over the years, I've seen articles in the news about munitions being found either on the artillery range, which was outside of the cantonment area where the barracks were, uh, either artillery shells that haven't, you know, hadn't, hadn't detonated or, or landmines or things like that. Uh, the hill behind the rifle range is probably got more lead in it than Leadville does. I mean, it's just uh, <laughs> really, really chock full of bullets. Um, and every now and then, you, you, the government will send out a bulletin, uh, please don't go to Camp Hale in, in this part of Camp Hale because we found a bullet or something, something crazy like that. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, the second half of your question, I don't know about that. The, the question was, uh, were some of the European-born skiers with language skills transferred out of the division and sent up to Northern Europe uh, to maybe act as translators or interrogators. There, I have a, a good friend who just passed away, well, just 10 years ago, uh, who was German born and he became a translator and German prisoner interrogator. He went through the, what they call the Ritchie Boys program at uh, Camp Ritchie, Maryland. And one of his jobs was when there was a prisoner taken, he would interrogate them, try and get as much information. And he also did some preliminary work before the Nuremberg war crimes trials to interview high-ranking Nazis. Uh, the first part of your question was, your dad came from Austria. Your father-in-law came from Austria in 39 and... Citizenship, yeah. Did he automatically become a citizen because he, he joined? And I think the answer would be no, because my co-author on Soldiers on Skis was a veteran in the 10th named Bob Bishop. And Bob Bishop was Canadian. And Bob told me that before they could go overseas to fight, 
that everybody in the division had to be American citizens. And for some reason, he either declined to do that or there was some problem that prevented him from becoming an American citizen at that time. He became an American citizen years later. But I think that question is, is probably right on, that, that they had to become American citizens before they could go off to war. I think they waived that requirement. I, they made it kind of a, an immediate sort of thing. You know, show up at the field house, those of you who want to be sworn in as American citizens, and they did it much, much more quickly. Yeah. Yes, ski patrol. Who was Cooper? Ski Cooper and Cooper Hill? I don't know. But Mr. Ski Patrol here <coughs> probably knows. Well, uh, Mr. Cooper was. Uh, <laughs> Didn't he parachute? Uh, that's a great question. He parachuted out of right, a plane yeah. with thousands of dollars yes, uh, in uh, Oregon. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. D.B. Cooper. No, I don't no, know. No, I'll find out. <laughs> you stumped the panel. <laughs> I'll go to the Google. <laughs> ah. Um, uh, yes, the young lady here said that her family is from Ohio, or your son-in-law's family is, is a Whitlock from Ohio. Interestingly enough, my wife is from Ohio, but she's not a Whitlock. Um, yeah, <laughs> my, my family, as far as I can trace back to my great-grandfather, uh, are, were from uh, central Illinois, where there are no mountains. There's, you know, no mountains whatsoever, and uh, he was he was drafted. It was kind of interesting because I'd already been born when he was drafted, and so he was married, had a kid. He was 26 years old, and so he should not have been in that next pool of draftees. But they nabbed him anyway. They uh, he, he went off to basic training, and he was going to be in the uh, coast artillery. And he was in, I think, Virginia at some uh, military installation along the coast. And he got appendicitis. And so they, after he got well, they transferred him out of the unit. And it just so happened it was he got drafted by the, the 10th when they opened it up to non-skiers. And so that's, uh, that's how he got in. Pardon? Did he leave through Chicago? I would guess that he probably did because he was living in the Chicago area at that time. Ah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. So from my research is that suddenly Minnie Dole was like, I have 5,000 mules. What am I, who's gonna care for the mules? And that's when they recruited a lot of farm guys out of the Midwest was to care for the mules because well, who was going to care? He was like, well, now what do I do? That's what, that's what I do. Yeah. Well, the, the uh, artillery had the bulk of the mules because you could break down a 75 millimeter pack howitzer into six components. You had the wheels, you had the barrel, you got the trails, you got all sorts of other parts, uh, and you could strap those six parts onto six mules. So every gun had to have six mules. And when you figure, I don't what, know what the number of, of uh, 75 millimeter pack howitzers they had in the, in the uh, three artillery battalions, but it added up to 4,000 <laughs> mules. Uh, and the quartermaster also used it. So you know, if supplies had to get up into the mountains, uh, the mules were the mode of transportation for that. Uh-huh. And the mules are still packing artillery rounds. Now, do you have the mules at, at uh, Fort Drum? That was at Sill, okay. Ah, okay. Huh. 
Interesting. Yes, ma'am. Um, no. Yeah, no, they were, I don't, I don't know exactly what my dad did. I think he was in high school and then he moved to the Chicago area and went to work for Lever Brothers or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or Western, or Western. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's my just horse is cool. Right outside. Flint. Yeah, Eric Miller. Mm. <laughs> I did find out, actually, it was named after Cooper Hill. So I don't know. I just tried to look up where did Cooper Hill get its name. I don't know, but it was already there was a Cooper Hill there, so they named it after Cooper Hill. I don't know. I'm and gonna, and I'm there's find it though. <laughs> oh wow! All right. And then uh, above the Cooper Hill is Chicago Ridge, which you know is—I don't know what the elevation of that is, but it's pretty pretty high. Yeah. Anybody else? You guys have been great to stay awake through this whole lecture, and uh, hopefully you had enough beer wine and uh, snacks to tide you through till dinner. I want to thank Jen Mason and the whole crew here at the Colorado Snow Sports Museum. They, they do such a wonderful job in keeping alive the history of skiing in Colorado and uh, hope you're at it for another 50 or 60 years. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Flynn. Thank you, Eric. Um, I just want to do a brief rundown of what's going on this weekend. So it is Legacy Days. So tomorrow on Vail Mountain at 11 a.m., the Blackhawk is landing at the top of Chair 2. You do need a ski pass. And it's not just any helicopter. For those of you that know, usually it comes from the HAPS, which is the High Altitude Training Center in Gypsum, which is just west of Vail. This helicopter is coming from Fort Drum. It took it three days to get here. This helicopter is actual like 10th mountain helicopter. It's landing at 11 a.m. tomorrow. And then tomorrow is also at 6.30 is the 10th mountain parade. At 6.30, if you haven't seen it, it's incredible. It's inspiring. It's super cool. And then the museum is open until 8 tomorrow night. And a lot of those guys end up right here in the museum afterwards. And then on Sunday at 11 a.m. at the top of Chair 4 is um, the Riva Ski Down. And for those of you that know, you now you know, you know why it's called Riva. So it's the Riva ski down at 11 a.m. And then at 3 o'clock is the Ski Trooper race. So there's this amazing, like, mountaineer race that goes on from 3 to 5 on Sunday afternoon on Peppy's face. And Truck Stole, Minnie Dole's grandson, will be here. So it's going to be pretty incredible. So thank you so much for visiting us this weekend. Thank you, Flint. Thank you, Eric, for writing this book, doing what you do, and just being so passionate about the 10th. Yes, we have the books for sale, and Flint and Eric will sign them for you. Thank you. Thank you.